For Pertone, Kukopkin, and Bakun and Bakchun, there comes an insistent cry for freedom. However, this cry is coupled with an idealist conception of, human, of the human individual, namely, human beings having a nature, and such a nature is social, but assuming a fixed human nature. These thinkers encounter logical difficulties. However, it is not necessary to try to reconcile a fixed human nature with anarchism, as conventionally we attempt it, but rather a notion of human nature that must be abandoned entirely. This strategy is necessary because as human nature and human freedom are irreconcilable, the assertion of a human nature makes the expression of the individual free will problematic. Without capacity for free will, the possibility of anarchism is nonsense, or put it in other terms, anarchy is, is only possible only because of humanity's capacity to freely make meaning of themselves and their world, as the existentialist asserts, humanity create itself, or to quote John Paul Strart, existence precedes essence. Through our own actions, we create our own always changing human nature. The argument is not that anarchism can work because human beings are naturally cooperative or irresponsible, but rather that anarchism is possible because we have the freedom to create ourselves. Of course, we may choose not to become anarchists. We may instead choose to be fascists or capitalists. The point is, we choose whether we want to or not, whether we acknowledge our choices or not, and therefore we are responsible for who we are. The affinity of anarchism and existentialism is not often noted, although few writers have recognized the complementarity of the two streams of thought. For instance, in her memoirs, Emma Goldman argues with a friend who accused Nietzsche of being an aristocrat. Nietzsche was not a social theorist, but a poet, a rebel, an innovator. His aristocracy was neither a birth nor a divorce, it was the spirit. In that respect, Nietzsche was an anarchist, and all true anarchists were aristocrats. And more recently, in a 1949 pamphlet, Herbert Reed explicitly argues for the, the com compatibility of anarchism and existentialism. Reed states, if you finally you ask me whether there is any necessary connection between this philosophy, existentialism, and anarchism, I will apply, in my opinion, anarchism is the only political theory that combines essentially the revolutionary and contingent attitude with the philosophy of freedom. It is the only military libertarian doctrine left in the world, and on its diffusion depends the progressive evolution of human consciousness and humanity itself. Reed argues that existentialism is a humanism that is a formation of the significance of our human destiny, is a philosophy that allows for the creation of meaning. Existentialism also allows us to shift the grounds of debate away from human nature with all its attendant problems to our consideration of how we can create freedom for ourselves and others. According to Reed, Existentialism is eliminating all systems of idealisms, all theories of life, or being subordinate that man to an idea, to an abstraction of some sort. It is also eliminating all systems of materialism that subordinate man to the operation of physical and economic laws. It is saying that man is the reality, and not even man in the abstract, but the human person, you and I, that everything else, freedom, Love, reason, God is a contingency depending on the real of the individual. This approach avoids the contradictions and limitations encountered by those theorists who assume a fixed human nature by allowing for an infinite variety of possibilities, including anarchy. In addition, not only does existentialism prove useful in the development of a coherent social theory, but it may argue that it's empirically true that history shows human individuals act in, in any number of ways. At times, they are cruel, brutal, and violent, but they also exhibit love to one another and practice altruism. 
with respect to women, both anarchism and existentialism represent inherent critiques of sexism. For instance, as anarchism opposes all form of hierarchy, it must be consistent and condemn the domination of women by men. As existentialism is a philosophy that takes human freedom as its point of departure, it ought to be capable of a non-sexist consideration of women in the discussion of the human condition. However, women are not always treated fairly by the existentialists. Nietzsche's misogyny is legendary, and such a belief that the obscurity of the fundament sets is that of everything that escapes open cannot be seen as anything but women hating. While some existentialists, to a greater or lesser extent, exclude women from the human project, they do so only by conceptualizing that the human is exclusively in masculine terms. This devaluation of women is not, however, implicit to existentialism. The integration of women into the discussion about human existence is demanded by a philosophy that regards human freedom as the only given. By the accepting an ethics based on existentialism, the grounds for the debate are now changed. Instead of discussing what constitutes human nature and what limitation that nature imposes, the problem shifts to a consideration of what constitutes human freedom and how freedom can be expanded. In her consideration of human freedom, Simone de Vero states that the Negro, the Negro slave of the 18th century, the Mahatan women enclosed in the harem, have no instrument to be thought or by the astonishment or anger which permits the, them to attack the civilization which oppresses them. Their behavior is defined and can be judged only by within the given situation. It is possible that in this situation, limited like every human situation, they realize a perfect assertion of their freedom, but once there appear a possibility of liberation, is a resignation of freedom not only to exploit the possibility of resignation which implies dishonesty, which is a positive fault. Bovar acknowledged the historical situation which human individuals are forever immersed. This human situation is the antithesis of the natural, it is humanly created and can thus be changed by human individuals to abandon divinely the given or naturally ordered world for the social world which people themselves create meaning results not only in freedom but also in ambiguity. The ambiguity arises from the fact if meaning is not fixed or natural or divinely, this meaning can be changed, and therefore truth requires ambiguity. ambiguity. There are also those who, when faced with the ambiguity of their own existence, assert that there is no God-given or absolute meaning, then there is no meaning at all. This cynicism turns freedom into nihilism, a posture assumed by the individuals in an attempt to evade the very responsibility of their own existence. The recognition that our world is nearly divinely or naturally ordered does not imply the meaning that does not exist as the nihilists would have us believe, but rather the meaning is immediately created. This not a cynical or nihilistic view of the world, on the contrary, if the ambiguity is implied in the world where meaning is created by an individual is fraught, which anguish who also brings the possibility of freedom. Bovar speaks of this difference between nihilism and freedom when she contrasts ambiguity with absurdity. The notion of ambiguity must not be confused of absurdity. To declare the existence is, is absurd is to deny that it can never be a given a meaning. To say that ambiguous, to assert that the meaning is never fixed, that it must be constantly one. Meaning must always be recreated by human individuals living in history, as there is no divinely given world. There is, there is as well no naturally given world. Human individuals create a world which simultaneously becomes a context for their own existence. This empathis of human individual is undeniably humanistic. Humanism does not have to me that humanity must disregard the natural world as a political philosophy can rather point to the social and historical meaning which human beings give to the natural world. This is not to say that the natural world ceases to exist without humanity, it would be however exists without meaning. Human individuals are natural but also simultaneously other than, not, 
other than that nature other nature by the virtue of the self-consciousness through this self-awareness human individuals create the meaning for themselves and their environment of course the natural world of which people find themselves yep apart provide a context for the socially created world however unlike the human individual nature is alone and capable of creating meaning or making free choice it it is the self-consciousness that is important to women the other impressed groups as alone open to the possibility of liberation freedom is not is at the century of existentialist thought for the existentialist human individuals are free free to project themselves into a meaningful future free to assert their own values at the end in themselves the freedom and the ambiguity arise of the fact that the human individual is, as Abu R puts it, being who's being not to be, that subjectivity which realizes itself only as the presence of the world that engage freedom, that surging out of the force itself, which is immediately given for others. Rar is referring to the fact that human individuals are always in the state of becoming, that is, they are never finished, they never achieve being. The, this lack of being is in fact the positive moment as it gives to humanity the possibility of creating themselves, their world, and their ethics freely. As Pravar points out, one does not offer an ethics to a god. It is impossible to propose to any man if one define him as nature as something given. Human individuals are, are not given but always in the process becoming. If humanity were like God could achieve being, there would be no questions of ethics since the meaning would be absolute. Ethics are needed only when it's called into a question. So in this ambiguity, this influx that humanity reaches out and freely gives out the value to the world. If meaning and value are not given, but rather created by the human individuals, how we are ethically to decide between choices before us for the existentialists is the very freedom and ambiguity of human existence which forms the basis of ethical behavior which starts states that man is nothing else but what he makes of himself he is saying that human individuals is freedom because at first we are nothing it is only through our existence that we create ourselves and creating ourselves we create all of humanity our actions imply ethics not only for ourselves for others certainly many people believe that when they do something themselves they are the only ones involved and when someone says to them with everyone's acted that way they shrug their shoulders and answer everyone that doesn't act that way but one but one really should ask himself what would happen if everybody looked at the things that way? There is no escaping this disturbing thought set by a kind of double dealing. A man who lies and makes excuses for himself by saying that everybody does that is someone with an easy, with an uneasy conscience. Because the act of lying implies a universal value is converged upon the lie. Thus one own choices are essentially the choices for all. And the ethics demanded by free human existence is one reaches out towards freedom itself. Oppression tries to defend itself by its utility. But we have seen that is one of the lies of a serious mind to attempt to give the word useful an absolute meaning. Nothing is useful. It is not useful to man. Nothing is useful to man if the latter is not in the position to find his own ends and values if he's not free. Freedom implies responsibility, oppression is unjustifiable. This emphasis of freedom is where the existentialism and anarchism converge. For anarchism to work in practice, each individual must not only be responsible for creating his or her own values, but he or she must also defend the freedom of others in order to protect his or her own our existentialist position of freedom then allows for an anarchist world. This broad could have been written by an anarchist. And it is true that each bound to all 
But that is the precisely ambiguity of his condition is a passion towards others. Each one exists absolutely as for himself. Each is interested in the liberation of all, but as a separate existence engaged in his own projects. So much so that the term useful to man, useful to this man, do not overlap. Universal and absolute man exist nowhere. From this angle, we are going to come on the same anti antimony. The only justification of sacrifice is its utility, but the useful is what serves man. Thus, in order to serve some men, we must do the disservice to others. By what principle are we choose between them? The problem is the same for the existentialists and the anarchists. How can one guarantee individual freedom when one must limit other freedoms to oppress? Pravar, this question was of utmost importance. The fascists slaughtered millions during the Second World War, the Nazi occupation of France, and the realization that revolutionary Russia was turned out to be the antithesis of freedom were all devastating events for her. It was the historical circumstance of Europe in the 1940s that prompted Rohr to wrote, A freedom which is occupying and denying freedom is itself outrageous that the outrageousness of violence which one practice against almost counsel, counsel out and one fact is that one finds himself forced to treat certain men as things in order to win the freedom of all. Oppressor in some way give their own claim to freedom as others are put in the position of having opposed them in order to win freedom for all. To live ethically, one must reach out towards the future and freely doing so, one must open the freedom and not only for oneself but for others. One must also ethically oppose those who would seek to limit the freedom of others, even if the opposition regrettably treat some individuals human individuals, those who oppress us as mere objects, for one must weigh the freedom of all against the freedom of some. The question remains, both the existentialists and anarchists, one, how does one know we, for certain but whether one is acting in the manner that truly is open up for freedom for all? Existentialists tell us that we will never know for certain. We choose to act in doubt, we anguish, but we cannot help but choose. We must decide upon the opportuniness of an act and attempt to measure its effectiveness without knowing all the factors that are present. A man of action in order to make a decision will not wait for a perfect knowledge to prove the necessity of certain choice. He must choose and thus help the fashion history. A choice of this kind is no more arbitrary than a hypothesis. It includes neither reflection nor even method. It also free and implies a risk that must be assumed as such. The movement of the mind, where it be called the thought of will, always starts up in dark in the darkness. We can never be sure of ourselves. Instead, we act in doubt and anguish, but nevertheless react, even in action. In its consequences, is an act and such fraught with doubt. The uncertain taints our freedom with ambiguity. It's the demand that we act thoughtfully and responsibly as uncertain actions change not only our world but ourselves as well. Doubt can be assumed positively. The admission of our own uncertainty can allow us to be more receptive to other points of view. While existentialism requires freedom to be ethics demanded by human existence, it is a freedom exercised in doubt and hence must not be assumed lightly. Brevard never called herself an anarchist. Nonetheless, her existentialist belief come very close to be anarchistic. Her emphasis on human freedom, her attempts to ground ethics in the very freedom, is existential for anarchism. Provar, freedom and ambiguity are a part of the human condition. She understands that human life has been in intimately connected to death. The continuous work of our life, said Modini, is to build death. Man knows and thinks this tragic ambivalence with the animal and plant merely undergoes a new paradox, therefore introduced into his, his destiny, rational animal, thinking greed, he escapes from his own natural condition without, however, freeing himself from it. He is still part of this world of which he is a consciousness. He asserts himself as a pure internality against which no external power can take hold in himself also experience themselves as a thing crushed by the dark ray of other things. 
at the moment he can grasp the non-temporal truth of this his existence. These opening words from both our ethics and ambiguity are interesting because they put death at the century of life to live in a such act conscious of the inf of the infantile while bound as a object to the finite for both are the tragedy of human existence the freedom of human existence is contained in the possibility despite death human individuals are project themselves into the future it is a future overshadowed by death as mary o'brien notes in her politics of reproduction dialectical materialism takes as a fundamental posture that the need to eat the simple sex that had been transformed by the clinical genius of Freud into a theoretical a priori of a system of thought. Death has haunted the male philosophical imagination since man figure first glimmered into action and our own time has become stark reality with a preoccupied pre existentialism and untidy and passionate pessimistic body of thought which lonely and horrid man attempts to defy the absurdity of the void which houses his consciousness and his world. The inevitability and necessity of these biological events has quite clearly not ex accepted them from the historical force and the theoretical significance. We have no comparable philosophies of birth. O'Brien's thesis is birth like eating, sexuality and dying is not a brute fact of nature, but is part of the human process creating meaning and making history. In fact, O'Brien argues that the labor done by women during childbirth and the labor childbearing itself creates what might call the ultimate value, human life. The labor, O'Brien argued, mediates between the individual and society. In other words, reproductive labor helps fulfill the absurdity of the boy by establishing a material, meaningful relationship between individuals that continues over time despite death. To speak in the existentialist terms, what could be more a project than the creation of human life itself through the creation of hu in the, through hu new human individuals? Repro reproductive labor projects a future for humanity as a whole. Despite our focus on death, she briefly touches on the significance of birth and the ethics and bigotry when she speaks of the degradation and resignation of oppressed people. Yet, with all the certain organization when there were children who played and laughed, and their smile exposed the lie of their oppressor, it was an appeal, a promise, a projected future before the child, a man's future, if in the oppressed country. A child's face is so moving, it is not the child is more moving, or that he has more of a right to happiness than others, it is that he is the living affirmation of human transcendence. He is on the, the watch. He is eager to hand, hand held out to the world. He is hope, a project. This is one of the few places in our writing where our acknowledged children as a project. The Project of Humanity, in her groundbreaking feminist work, The Second Sex, published in, Fran in the French in 1949 and the English translation in 1953, where it points to death as explicitly opposed to death as the only truth of human existence, Boar argues that transcendence is found in the warrior for it's the more that man proved dramatically that life is not supreme value for man, but on the contrary that it should be made to serve ends to a more important than itself. The worst curse that lay upon woman was that she should ex be excluded from the war like four ways. For it is not given life, but risking life that man is raised above the animal, and that is why the superiority has been, has been a core in humanity, not to sex that brings forth, but to which kills. To base freedom on humanity, on death instead of life, is problematic indeed. In the age where nuclear annihilation is a very real possibility, a philosophy based on the solely death is suicidal. The recognition that giving birth is a way to project oneself and humanity freely into the future would give existentialism the life-affirming quality that must be demanded from any political philosophy today. If the life labor of childbirth and childbearing is, is not only a project, but one which human individuals gain a sense of connectedness to others and the ability to transcend death and the birth and the raising children ought to be central concerns of any society. In fact, 
Most societies regulate, regulate such labor to women only, where it's seen to, seen to lack a value. The birth and raising children is valuable precisely because the human individual is the ultimate value. That the fact Bovard does not recognize that this does not mean that existentialism must, must be rejected altogether. Rather, existentialism, preoccupation with death, must be added a consideration of birth. The understanding of death and birth as a form dialectic of human existence. Existentialism offers a political philosophy that places the Hindu individual in the position of freedom and responsibility to it. Some contemporary feminists add a life affirming dimension, anarchism must take from both. In the practical sense, what be adoption a feminist infused existentialism means for anarchism? In any in addition to the tradition traditional challenge of setting up a non hierarchical social and economic system, anarchists will also have to consider a way which childbirth and childbearing could be shared by all members of the community. This is not to say that every person had to be have to reproduce biologically, but rather the communities ought to explicitly create a child supporting environment. While anarchists and existentialists may have not generally regarded children as important important issues feminists have. Consider for example, Charlotte like Perkins Gimmon Exploration of Race and Children in the Fictional World Hartland, Ray in 1915 For Gilman, childbearing education should be a process undertaken in freedom within the atmosphere of mutual respect. Being a child does not mean exclusion from the adult world or denial of rights. Childhood is a time when children should be encouraged to experiment and play and learn and grow freely. Gilman does not speak about men and women sharing and raising and educating children since the only inhabitants of the fictional world currently are women. It's perhaps precisely this absence of men allows Gilman in 1915 country on the issue of children. A private realm women's issue that is conspicuously absent in the most public issue oriented male writing in Herdland. Gilman is saying that what we've seen as a private realm activities are really political issues. These issues that anarchism must address if it's truly to fight oppression and hierarchy in all firms. More recently, Mars Percy unfolds our alternative world contrast to today's society and women on the edge of time, childbearing in the fictional community of of the city is shared by the three people who take primary responsibility for their children. School such as school as such has been eliminated. Children learn through working with other children and adults. Jack Rabbits and Lucentite and choose Connie, a woman from our time and place to their world. Children then are fully integrated into the community. That means that all men and women have same, have the some connection to children as they work and play with the children in every thing they do. Children are treated as people, not objects. The education gained by being full members of the community is a rich fund for the children and adults alike. Everyone benefits from this humane, non-authoritarian approach to childbearing. Children grow up with self-respect and the concern for others, while adults establish direct connections with the next generation, the future. As the characters explain, we all teach. The kids work with us. We try to share that we have to learn and we don't know. I think maybe growing up is a less mysterious with us, since the adults' world isn't separate. What's a better place to learn anatomy than a clinic? What's a better place to learn botany than a field of corn? What's a better place to study mechanics than a repair shop? We ask a lot. We ask a lot of of our kids, but politely, it's not one to one buying you have with your daughter. But what you say, we have more space and more people to love us. This humane approach to children, which ultimately means a humane approach to oneself. How many adults look back at their childhood and shudder at the remembrance of the authoritarian parents and teachers? How many feel emotionally deformed as adults because they were treated as subhuman as children? 
for education and childbearing to be humane, they must be anti-authoritarian. Children deserve to be brought up in anarchy and freedom. Children are the epitome of the human project because they are open-ended or to put it another way, free. A sane, humane society must learn from the must learn from the characters of the novel the art of being with children from the same people. However, excellence is equated with authoritarianism in order to put children to excel. He must be forced to practice whether to be multiplication tables or piano scales. These people have lost sight of children as concrete end in itself. Rather, they see the child as a means to an abstract end. Excellence in the interview, Marge Pessy about women on the edge of time. Barbara Dunning and June Lund asked whether they're the way the people now study said to be resistant would be lost in the world like the city in the novel. Percy responds that yes, some practices we have today would be considered appropriate in a more humane culture. I think that probably with certain kinds of things would be Laws. For instance, the violin prodigy who start as two and practice 17 hours a day, yes, I don't think there would be any, but I think there would be anybody who would be willing to leave their life warped in that way. If you value the sound that you get of castrated boys enough to castrate boys get it, if you don't want, you won't. I think that society in which no thing is valued enough to destroy a person to get it, I suspect that such a society which produce actually more interesting art. Almost everyone in the society practice some art and some people do it full time. Percy is concerned not the production of culture but with the production of healthy people. As human individuals are ends in themselves and ought not to mate into the means that serve any ends a Percy point is well taken. Both Percy and Gilman argue in their work that childbearing education should become universal concerns with everyone in that society taking part. Gilman posits that all female society as a means to generalize what is considered to be traditional feminine issues. Piercy has both men and women sharing the role of primary caregiver. For the writers advocates the integration of children and reproductive labor into the public realm, which they argue will have a positive effect on society as a whole. Anarchists can learn from these and other feminists the value of life and the importance of integrating the petrol of life onto the mainstream society. For everybody looked that took part in the raising of children who could order those very children into war. Existentialism and anarchism are the theory and practice that see individual freedom as necessary. Feminists understand that there will be no individual without birth. Existentialism and insisting that the world is created by human individuals allow for infinite numbers of features, even the possibility of a world without hierarchy. If the human individuals are on themselves projects, then children are projects of a project. Individuals must then, in freedom, reach beyond themselves to others, whether they live today or yet to be born. The Politics of Individualism by L. Susan Brown